welcome to this week's virtual worship gathering. Um, I just got back just a little while ago from our first in-person worship gathering in seven months, and I just have to say it was so good worshiping with you all in person again. Uh, we know that there were still some who did not feel comfortable joining us in person, and we want you to know how important it is for us that while we enter into this season of kind of a hybrid model of in-person worship gatherings and virtual worship gatherings, that we, it's really important to us that nobody feel excluded uh, who is not feel comfortable joining us at the in-person worship gathering. So what you're about to see uh, is a recording of the message that was given at the in-person worship gathering tonight so that uh, those who were able to be there in person and those who were not uh, will still be able to uh, dialogue about the points that were raised and the, the teaching that was given uh, in our missional community meetings throughout the week. Uh, or as you break these down with your family. So we're so glad for those of you who are able to join us. And uh, for those of you who were not, uh, please enjoy this virtual worship gathering. And we look forward to worshiping with you in person again uh, soon. God bless.
shadows deepen We do Do you know that all the dark Won't stop the light from getting through We do Do you wish that you could see it all made new We do Well, good evening, everybody. I am excited to be here. I'm excited to see you. I got to tell you, this is a true story. So this evening, as we were praying before you got here, I was praying. I literally got giddy and just started laughing and giggling a little bit, just thinking about the chance I would have to see your face, even with the mask on. It's beautiful, and I love to see you here. And before I forget, I want to mention this. If, If you have children here, anybody in Forge Kids, we have something like this in a little packet. And so I want to tell you, we put, gave you a little packet to color and to do a few things like that with, with the kids to keep, give them some activities to, to follow along. But this is something special. It says, be kind. 
And I want each of our kids to know that this is in your packet. I want you to hang on to it. And at the end of the night, I'm going to ask you to do something really special with that, okay? So I'm going to put that there. And you guys, you know that sometimes I forget stuff. Yep, you got it, Caden. You know, sometimes I forget stuff. So if you think I'm forgetting it, you just yell out to me. Make sure I don't forget that, okay? And then we'll be great and good to go with that. So I'm excited to be here. We've been doing a series called Politically Correct. And, and I've really sort of enjoyed that. It's been a lot of fun working through that. The very first week, Jeff sort of challenged us with the idea that citizenship is a form of stewardship. He sort of kicked things off and also sort of gave us the one ground rule we have. And that ground rule is we're not going to tell anybody how they should vote. Uh, stop, start. I am trying to reset, go. There you go, <laughs> technology. And so now you know I have a timer on. So I've already been told if I go over, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. So I'm going to try and zip it and keep going with this thing. But we, one of the ground rules we have is this, is that we're not going to tell you who to vote for, what party to vote for, how to vote. But we're here to help you process and grapple with some of this so you can do your best to have an informed vote that's going to help you to say who might be the, the person or the, 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 the people that I should be voting for that's going to best reflect the values that God has and going to help our country move forward in that way. So we're not going to do that. So Jeff talked about the idea that citizenship is a form of stewardship. Neil came up and talked about the concept of missional citizens and how missional citizens are really more involved and really focused on more of a local politics versus a national politics, much like our missional communities live into our communities in which we live and serve and, uh, and work. So last week, Jeff sort of hit a couple of things. He gave us a twofer on that one, right, Jeff? So the one idea is that, that uh, we are called to love our political opponents, both in practical and material ways. And that sort of picked up on the Love the Neighbor series. But he also had this idea that we are citizens of the kingdom first and foremost, not identifying necessarily with a nation or even a political party, but more, more so with our Lord and our King and that kingdom. So tonight, we're going to, going to follow in the same vein, and I'm going to throw up on the screen right here tonight's big idea, because I want to put this out there right away. I want us to be thinking about this as we process what we're going to be talking about tonight. So here's the, the big idea we're going to talk about tonight. This, that as citizens of the kingdom, we are to be advocates for those who cannot speak for themselves. So I want that to sink in. I'm going to say it one more time. As citizens of the kingdom... We are to be advocates for those who cannot speak for themselves. So God has a lot to say in his word in the Bible uh, to you and to I, both as individuals and also as government officials, that we are to come alongside and to help and serve people. We're to speak up for those in our communities who are disadvantaged, oppressed, or don't have a voice. In the short time we have together tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at this concept of what it means to be an advocate. We're going to look at the example of Jesus and how Jesus was an advocate for us. And we're also going to look at the implications that has for us as this election cycle draws closer and closer to the election itself. First, let's talk about definition. When I throw out the word advocate, what am I talking about? A lot of you might have seen on TV or be aware of, and the news are everywhere, right? Political advocates. And just to be honest, it seems like political advocates, advocates, if I can say it correctly, political advocates, it seems like really it's more about them, right? It's about power, it's about FaceTime, it's about likes and tweets and all those kind of things. It seems to be really less about the, the cause and the people and more about them. And that is not what we're talking about. We're talking more of a biblical advocate. We're talking more about the example of Christ. So I'd like to start sort of with a definition. On the screen here, you're going to see a definition that I sort of like. It's this. An advocate is someone who comes alongside, stands with, and speaks out for those in our community who are disadvantaged, oppressed, or don't have a voice. I want to say that again because I want us to catch that. Someone who comes alongside, someone who stands with and speaks out for those in our community who are disadvantaged, oppressed, or don't have a voice. So when you think about that, in the New Testament, 
it, it uses the term paraclete. And paraclete uh, is the word that we translate in English called advocate. It's also translated counselor, helper, uh, what else is it? Counselor, helper, and comforter are some of the words. Those words are used both of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but it has this idea of coming alongside to help, to encourage, and to lift someone up. Now at Awaken, that's not an unfamiliar concept with us. You, early on in our uh, existence as a church, we felt it was important for us to advocate for and to learn how to love those who were hurting or disadvantaged in our community. And as we looked around, we, we thought, who best fits the DNA of Awaken, and who can we best serve? And so we chose to come alongside those who are victims of human trafficking. And we partnered with a ministry that uh, is VB, uh, VBJI, and they have a ministry that serves and advocates for those who are hurting, those who have been victims of human trafficking. So that's not a, an unusual concept for us. But what I want to challenge us tonight is to try and look at this whole idea of what does it really mean for you and I as individuals and then collectively as a church family and even when we walk into the voting booth, what does it mean to be an advocate? So uh, at its core, I think an advocate is someone who invests themselves into the mission of lifting up and benefiting someone else who can't do it from themselves. So it's a ministry that we invest ourselves to lift up and help somebody else who can't do it for themselves. Now, this isn't a new concept in the Bible. Actually, since the Bible was written way back in the Old Testament, there's been a lot of challenges about this whole idea of advocating for those. We have a couple of uh, uh, passages we're going to look at here that refer back to the Old Testament and challenge us to think about what does it mean to advocate for, to come alongside and serve and help those in our community. The first one that's going to come up is from Proverbs 31.8. What's really cool about this, this was a, this was a passage that was written uh, in Proverbs, but it was taught to King, King Lemuel by his mother. So, he, you know, they didn't have elections back then. You were born into a ruling family, and ultimately you got your turn. So they, his mother knew that he was going to be coming up, going to be king one day, and so she began to invest in him to teach him what was important when he became king and try to say, hey, it's not all about you. It's about those who you serve. And this is what the, past, the verse says here. It says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. That is what it means to advocate. She was trying to teach her son, who would ultimately become a governing official, right? This is what you're supposed to do when you get there as king. And then later on in Psalms, there's, a, there's a, a verse in Psalms 82 that gives us the same challenge. This wasn't written specifically to a king, but it was written really to all of us, and in particular those who might have responsibility over others. And to say, what does it look like when you have responsibility or you have authority over someone else? And it says this, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So those are some passages in the Old Testament that you remind us. This gives us a glimpse not only into what advocacy is and what it means to advocate for somebody, but it gives you this idea that it's just not some edict that's put out there. There's this concept of coming alongside, of walking with somebody down their path of life as we try to help them when they can't help themselves. It's an expectation that God had on all those who would rule and all of us who call him or part of his kingdom. We have that same expectation on us. And that expectation continued into the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I think we see a great example of that in Jesus himself. So when we jump in the New Testament, there's so many examples. And it's like, where do you start off with? But Jesus advocated for, for people constantly through his ministry. I think of the time where, where there was a woman who was caught in adultery, and all the religious people picked up stones and wanted to kill her. And Jesus stood beside her and stood in front of her between her and those who wanted to harm her 
and diffuse that situation. He advocated for her. And then down the road, there, were, there was a man who had been born blind. He'd been blind for 40 years. And people looked at him and said, yeah, this guy, either him or his parents, they did something really bad. And they, they challenged him. They, they, they criticized him. They threw him out of their presence. And Jesus stepped beside this man, advocated for him, healed him, and did for him what he couldn't do for himself. And then remember the time, I think since our four kids are here tonight, remember the time when, when everybody said, hey, keep those kids away from Jesus. He's way too busy and way too important for kids. And Jesus said, no, 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 you don't get it. Bring the kids to me. I want to have them close. Jesus advocated for women. He advocated for men. He advocated for kids and brought them close by. But at the end of his ministry, as he began to near the cross, Jesus had, I think, some pretty amazing, uh, uh, pretty amazing opportunities to advocate for people. For example, uh, Jesus, when he actually, when he came, when he was born, right, when he came from heaven and came down to earth, he came alongside humanity. Uh, in Isaiah, and then again in Matthew, one of the names we sing at Christmas time, it said Jesus will be called Wonderful Counselor, right? Almighty God, it says Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, right? So imagine that. Here's God himself who's going to be our advocate, and it says, what does it mean? Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us. He came down. Jesus left the perfection and the beauty and the holiness of heaven, and he came down to a dark and a broken and a sinful world so he could walk beside us the same path we walk, so he would be our advocate. He came to do that for the very people he wanted to save. It begs the question, makes me ask this question of myself, and maybe you can ask this of yourself as well. And the question is this, who am I willing to leave my comfort zone for to come alongside and enter into their world? I'm going to repeat that again because I don't have this on the screen. Who am I willing to leave my comfort zone for to come along and enter into their world. Jesus, as our advocate, came alongside his name, said, God with us. Who am I willing to do that for? And then we'll see that right before his crucifixion, Jesus spent an agonizing night in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he was there, one of the last things he did was to advocate before God for his disciples and for you and I. In John 17, it says he prayed specifically for his disciples, and then he prayed for those who would follow. And he advocated, he prayed so hard, he, he dropped uh, sweats of blood that was coming out. Jesus was our advocate for the disciples and us in the garden. And then this is really, really crazy. He was an advocate for us on the cross. Because as Jesus hung there, the very people that he came to walk the path with, the very pe people he came to offer life and eternal life to, the very people he came to save were the people who crucified him and nailed him to a cross. And then with one of the last things Jesus said from that cross, as he heaved to make the breath, he cried out in a loud voice and said, Father, what? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He was advocating. That's advoca advocation, advocacy. That's Coming alongside, <laughs> yeah, I'll say it right one of these times, right? I'll get it right one of these times. So that's, that's what he was doing. So it makes me ask this question. Who am I willing to pay the price to advocate for? And, uh, and let me say it again. Am I willing to pay the price to advocate for those who can't speak for themselves and may not appreciate it? Am I willing to pay the price to advocate for those who can't speak for themselves and may not appreciate it. That's the example that Jesus gave us. And then finally, as Jesus rose from the grave, it was a wonderful thing. We celebrate Easter, and he, he walked this earth for 40 days, and he prepared his church and prepared his disciples when he was going to go. And Jesus said, hey, I'm going to leave, and I've got to go, because when I go, I'm going to send another, the word there says, comforter it's the word that we translate paraclete which means advocate another one to call out to come along beside with you of the exact same kind i mean it's a pretty amazing thing let's look at the verse here it's going to be on the screen in john 14 16 it says this and i will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help to be with you forever the spirit 
of truth. And what's amazing is he said he would give you another. That word another means another of the exact same kind. So when Jesus physically inhabited a body and he walked on this earth, he could literally be in one place at one time, just like us, because he was captured in time and space and captured in a body. But he says, I have to go as I advocate for you in heaven and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who, is, who will advocate for you and he will be indwell us as Christ's followers. He will indwell us and be with us and be there every step of the way. So he left and sent another one of himself to indwell us as that. I think that's just an incredible thing. He sent the Holy Spirit, what? To represent him on earth as he was in heaven being our advocate the holy spirit here is on earth being our advocate and the holy spirit is the representation of who jesus is so the question i ask myself is this is who will i ask to advocate in my place when i can't be present who will i ask to advocate in my place when i can't be present and this one sort of has election implications doesn't it when we talk about that if our governor officials are to advocate for these things to come alongside people, those who are oppressed, those who are downtrodden, those who don't have a voice. We need to be thinking about who we're going to ask to do that in our place when we can't be everywhere, we can only be here. So it really leaves implications with that. I want to share a quick story uh, that I think sort of indicates what it means to come along beside somebody. So many years ago, I don't know how long ago, my, my daughter was in college, my youngest. Uh, she was dr- driving, she had come home for the weekend, was driving her car home uh, with a, another girlfriend that she had brought back from college, and driving down the road, down in, in the center of town where we lived, a small little town, and she was driving down there, she saw this big, hairy, scary dude walking across the street, okay? Hair out to here, beard out to there, disheveled clothes, obviously look homeless, walking down the street. And they drove by, and she just felt this impression. She just felt like God spoke to her and said, you need to help that man. And she's thinking, I'm a college girl, I'm with a college girl, and that guy's big, hairy, smelly, and scary. But she turned to her friend and said, hey, you know, i thinking, I just got this feeling that God wants us to go back and help this guy. And her girlfriend said, we're just a couple of girls. He said, I know, but I just said, hey, if you think that's what God wants you to do, let's do it. They turned around their car, drove back, and the guy was on the side of the street. They pulled over and said, hey, um, you look like you need some help. Can we help you in some way? And the guy said, well, you know, I've been walking up this way. I'm trying to find a street that I'm looking for. And Carrie said, well, what street are you looking for? And he, she, she said, I'm trying to find Brogel Road. And Carrie said, well, well, that's funny. I live on Brogel Road. So who are you looking for? Because maybe I'll be able to help you find that person. I know my neighbors and that kind of stuff. The guy said, I'm looking for this guy I met at the cafe down the street. His name's Pastor Steve. You think you can help me find him? And Carrie's like, yeah, that's my dad. I think I can help you. And she loaded, they loaded this guy up in the car and drove him to our house. Laura and I were out and about. We had just gotten in and we're getting out of our car. Next thing you know, Carrie gets out and Big John gets out. Some guys call him John the Baptist because he had hair everywhere and he had beard everywhere and he had smell everywhere and all that crazy stuff. Well, the guy had been homeless for a while. He'd been living in a shed in someone's backyard. It was Thanksgiving time. It was cold. In Ohio, it snows and freezes at that time. And the the guy's shed he was living in kicked him out and said, you're going to die back there. I can't have you die on my property. So he kicked him out. So he was looking for help. So to make a long story short, we were able to round him up some short-term help for about a week, and then we got him into a house that he was able to stay in for a number of years. I knew John for about 10 years, and probably by the amount of time I knew him, he was probably homeless for half that time. But he would come to that ministry that, that uh, Mike and I used to serve at and be loved on and be cared for and be served there. So the next week was Thanksgiving, and we were throwing a special Thanksgiving meal for all the people in the area because that ministry focused on the high school kids across the street over here and the trailer park, which was really run down over here, and the homeless people in the area. And we're having a little Thanksgiving meal, and John showed up. And John was there, and he was having a Thanksgiving meal, and he came over to me and said, hey, I'm just so grateful that your daughter stopped by and, and picked me up and that kind of stuff. And I said, hey, John, do you know the story behind that? He's like, 
no, man, she just picked me up. So I proceeded to tell John that story about how he just, Carrie just felt like God was impressing her to pick him up. As I told him that story, he literally just, boom, fell to his knees. He grabbed my hand, and it was, it was just passion coming out. He just said, now I know that God cares for me. Now I know. Why? Because somebody said, I'm willing to come along beside this person. I don't know. I'm willing to go outside my comfort zone. I'm willing to reach out and try to help and just see what God can do. That is a picture of an advocate. That is a picture of what God calls us to do. So I got to close this thing up here. So here's the challenge that I'm going to leave us tonight. First of all, forge kids. If you guys have your little piece of paper, I want you to, you don't have to grab it right now, but I want you to grab this and take it home because I'm going to ask you to do something special with this. I'm going to ask all the adults this. I want you to think, and the way this works is the Holy Spirit who advocates for us, advocates for others, and just like the Holy Spirit prompted my daughter to pick up that guy on the side of the road, he prompts us as well. And so here's my question. Here's my question. Who in your life needs an advocate? Who in your life needs someone to come along beside them and just love them, and just walk the path with them, and just help them do something they can't do for themselves. Who needs that? Think about it. Pray about it. Over the next couple days, as the Holy Spirit begins to, to touch your heart, write it down. If you're here in Forge Kids, I want you to take this paper, and when you go home, color it. Think about it. And it's, it says, be kind, right? And that's our reminder. We need to be kind to people around us. And the bottom, there's a place to put your name. And normally you write your name. Hey, my name is Steve and I colored this picture. But instead, I want you to take this. I want you to color it. And then I want you to pray and say, God, who do I need to be kind to in my world? Maybe it's in your school. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. And then write their name underneath that. Maybe it's Billy and write Billy. Maybe it's uh, Sarah and write that name down. And then put it up in your room to remind you, I need to be kind to that person. I need to help them. I need to come alongside them and do that. So adults, think about that. Uh, text yourself a note. Write in your phone. Put it on your computer screen. Do that. Kids, write on that piece of paper. Who do I need to advocate for? The next, the next one is really not a question. It's really more of a challenge. I heard this once and I love it because I think it's a great picture of what it means to be an advocate. It says this, do for one what you wish you could do for all. So how can one person change the world? Well, it's going to be pretty tough, right? But one person can change somebody else's world completely. So do for one what you wish you could do for all. Who is God asking me to, to be an advocate for? Who is God asking me to walk beside? And then do for one what you wish you could do for all, and you will change that person's life just like John's life was felt. It hit him so hard he fell to his knees when he heard what God had done there. And finally, the last thing here is this. Who in your life needs an advocate? Do for one what you wish you could do for all. And finally, support and vote for those who will serve and advocate for those who don't have a voice in our community. As we're talking about this politically correct series, the whole idea is we have an election coming up. And we're not here to tell you how to vote, but we're telling you to think about this. I'm going to say it again. Support and vote for those who will serve and advocate for those who don't have a voice in our community. I want to close off with this, um, with this quote. I found it uh, as I was sort of doing a little research and studying for this. Um, it says this, God also calls each of us to be good stewards of our gifts. As Americans, we have the gift of influence with our government. A lot of people don't have that. As Americans, we do. When, uh, when we steward the gift well, leaders can make decisions that fight the systemic causes of poverty, conflict, and injustice. I just want to read that one more time. God also calls each of us to be good stewards of our gifts. As Americans, we have the gift of influence with our government. When we steward the gift well, leaders can make decisions that fight the systemic causes of poverty, conflict, and injustice. God calls us individually to be advocates for those who need it. God calls us to ask people 
as Americans who have that influence to serve, who will also advocate for the people who need it so desperately. So as we go out this week, look around. Who is God asking me to advocate for? As the election approaches, who is the best person who can advocate for people who so desperately need it? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you loved us, that you came from heaven down to earth to walk beside us. God with us, Emmanuel. You were the, the advocate. You came alongside the paraclete. Thank you that you loved us so much that you just didn't throw stuff at us from a distance, but you showed up on our doorstep and you walked with us. I pray this week as we go out into our workplaces and our schools and our homes and our communities that we will be uh, acutely aware of the, the, the challenge you've given us to be the advocate. That God, that we will be willing to step out of our comfort zone, that we'll be willing to pay the price, even if it's not appreciated, for those who need us to come along beside them and to care and to step up. And God, we pray as a nation, as we are getting closer and closer to the election, that we will be able to elect the person who will be that advocate for those in our country who are so downtrodden and so much injustice and so broken. God, help us to live that out personally and help us to be able to uh, express that with those that we choose to be our leaders. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name.